Thanks, Sars. We're now officially in the last quarter of 2020. Hallelujah! Can you believe it? It's just one month until we aim to be back in the building on the 1st of November. And we're still believing God for the finances to allow us to record and stream our church services live. We've still got to buy the tech and we've got to buy all of it this coming week. So if you were planning to give towards this, now would be a fantastic time to do that. Can I just take a moment to speak into this project quickly? Whenever we have a big project as a church, whether it's upgrading facilities or feeding thousands of families or purchasing the church property, or in this case, buying the technology we need to stream church services, these huge items can't be covered by the usual monthly giving of tithes. When we tithe, and I know some people don't like the word tithe, but when we every month give a percentage of our income towards God's work at a specific local church, that's actually giving God what's already His. It's our way as Christians of saying thank you to God that we can earn an income. And as I said, that is given to a local church to extend its ministry to its community. It's ministry to kids, teens, young adults, couples, our ordinary church services, all those sorts of things. Now, this kind of giving is the baseline for Christians, and it's what's helped the church to minister for thousands of years. For these big projects that I mentioned, things like property or technology or feeding on a large scale, we rely on what we call offerings. Offerings are when people feel led by God to give over and above their usual monthly giving. And that's always towards specific projects. So I want to add one more thing about this. And it's not to highlight SARS and I in any way. But we always put our money where our mouth is with these projects. We felt God leading us to give 30% of our salary towards the streaming technology that we've spoken about. And so we did. And that's over and above the normal 10% that we give every month. Why am I telling you this personal information? Because the church we lead needs to understand that we aren't standing here asking for your money as if it makes us rich. We aren't encouraging you to put God first with your finances every month, but we won't. We aren't encouraging you to give sacrificial offerings and trust God with your finances, but we're not prepared to do that. No, we are all in this together. We believe that our sacrificial offerings are not an expense, they're an investment. It's not an earthly investment where you see a 5 or a 10 or a 15% return on your investment over time. No, it's an eternal investment. And that's what Jesus was speaking about in Matthew 6 verse 19 to 21 when he said, Don't store up treasure on, here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them. And where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. These big projects are always designed to help us minister more effectively so that we can reach more lost people with the good news of Christ. So, we are so blessed to know that God can take our money and use it to reach souls for eternity, treasures in heaven. This little pre-message isn't designed to manipulate you into giving. It's actually a teaching moment because so many Christians just don't understand the difference between our regular monthly giving or our tithes and sacrificial offerings. When it comes to your regular giving, you don't need to wait for God to speak to you about if He wants you to start giving. He's already spoken clearly in His Word about giving to your spiritual home, to the church that feeds you and your kids spiritually. For this, you're not waiting for God to speak. He's waiting for you to be obedient because the first of our income belongs to God. When it comes to offerings though, it's a little bit different. But it's still simple. Pray and ask God how much you should give. 
and then be obedient. If he says nothing, give nothing. If a figure comes into your mind, give it cheerfully, knowing that you're investing in extending his kingdom. That's how Saz and I work. I ask God for a figure that we must give, and Saz does the same on her own. And then we ask each other what we felt God saying, and it's often the exact same amount, or at least pretty close usually. And then we give it, trusting that God will supply our needs. I know this is a, a bit of a long teaching moment, but I do feel that it's important for us to know today. And I felt it was important for me to share. All right, let's get into the main message now. If you've been joining us online for the last two weeks, you know that we're in a super helpful sermon series called Learning from Failure. And the whole point of this series is that we don't just learn from Bible heroes. We know a lot of the heroes of the Bible, but we don't just learn from them. We can learn as much from the failures in the Bible as we can from the successes. Sherry Lee started off the series a couple of weeks ago preaching about Sarah and how she tried to help God out when he seemed to be taking a bit too long to fulfill his promise to her and Abraham. Well, the big lesson from that message was that every promise has a process and that's so good for us to remember. If you're in that waiting period, maybe even right now, hold on and keep trusting our Heavenly Father. Last week, Sars brought a fantastic word about Samson. His failure was that he constantly put himself first and he put God second. And we all do that. Whether it's choosing to buy more material possessions or get a little bit of extra sleep or be in an unhealthy relationship, whether it's choosing those things over what God desires for us. If you missed either of those messages of Sherry Lee or Sars, do yourself a favor and watch them on our YouTube channel. In fact, if you click on the little white subscribe picture on the bottom right of your screen, I'm not sure, it's it's here or there, I think it's here, you'll get a little notification every time we upload a new sermon. And you can do that now if you want. It literally takes a second to click it and subscribe. Okay, now for my part in this series, Let's see if you can guess who I've chosen based on some clues that I'm going to give you. Hmm, you ready for this? If you're watching live online, you can put your guess in the comments and we're going to see who got it right first. The first person to guess right gets a free cappuccino at the church cafe. Are you ready to go? Here's some clues. His name means Yahweh is God. Anything coming to mind? Here's another clue. He comes from a town called Tishbe. Here's another one. He met with God on Mount Sinai. Is it coming any clearer? Here's another. He's Israel's most famous or well-known prophet. Come on, you've got to be getting warm now. Here's another one. And this is a big one. He never died. Come on, there was only a couple of people that happened to. And here's another one. He was both in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, and he was in the New Testament. Have you got it yet? Come on, by now you've got to have him. I've chosen the man, the prophet, the legend, Elijah. And if you were the first to guess Elijah in the chat or in the comments, you can get your free cappuccino at the church cafe this week. Just go and grab it. Lee will sort you out. Well, Elijah is an incredible character in the Bible. And here's what I want to do today. I I want to tell you some of the amazing things that he's done. But before I do that, I always like to start off giving a bit of context because you might have heard of Elijah But you may not know where or how he fits into the Bible story. This background stuff is so helpful and I really actually enjoy doing it now. I didn't always enjoy it because when I was a younger Christian, I thought that the Bible, that this book was just a huge book of all sorts of stories with nothing much in common except that they all mention God a lot. Well, I was never able to join the dots between the Garden of Eden Noah and the ark, Jonah and the big fish, the 10 plagues in Egypt and Jesus. I heard all the stories, but I didn't know how they fitted in. 
When I began to study theology though, it quickly became clear that the Bible isn't just a bunch of random stories from thousands of years ago that's been thrown together in this book. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. It's not random at all. There is one common thread that runs from the start of the Bible all the way to its end. It is one common theme. And here it is. God is redeeming and restoring a fallen world. It's actually a very sad story. It's the story of God creating man, but then man turning his back on God. But then God making a way for that relationship to be restored again. And that happens over and over and over and over again until finally God himself comes into a broken world as Jesus. And for one last time, he permanently opens the way for man to be in relationship with himself. And that's the good news of Jesus in a nutshell. Isn't it awesome? So how does Elijah, this old man, fit into that grand story? It's a good question. Thank you. Let's go from where God rescues his people from slavery in Egypt. Many of us know that. Maybe if you've seen the Prince of Egypt and you know the story, they come out of Egypt and they wander around in the desert for 40 years. And then eventually they enter the promised land that God gives them. Then God begins to give them judges to rule over them. And as we saw last week, they kept turning their back on God. And God kept saving and restoring them. After that judges cycle repeats itself a whole bunch of times, the people decide they're tired of judges now. They want a king like all the other nations. And God allows it. And again, they turn their backs on God. In fact, worse with every new king. And again, God keeps saving them. But it's not too long after that. That God's chosen people, Israel, which is made up of 12 tribes, is cracked and divided into two separate kingdoms. But we're going to go deeper into that in next week's message. So don't miss that. So now we've got this two tribes, these two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And again, we see the exact same patterns. Both kingdoms turn their back on God and they start worshiping other gods. And so God steps in again to warn and rescue them. This time, he sends in prophets to warn the kings and the people to turn back to God. Well, guess what? They don't. And that's where Elijah finally fits in. He is one of the prophets that God used to speak to the kings and the people that were turning their backs on him. I hope that makes sense to you now that you can fit Elijah into your mental timeline of the Bible story. Now that you know his place, let me tell you a couple of the highlights of his ministry before we look at the failure that we can learn from today. Elijah, he, he almost seems to just appear out of nowhere on the pages of scripture. And right from the start, he gets a tough message from God for the king of the northern kingdom. Remember the two kingdoms. That king's name is Ahab. Ahab had turned his back on God in a big way. Listen to this from 1 Kings chapter 16 verse 30 and 33. It says, But Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. And as though it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, who was a king before him, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbal of the Sidonians, and he began to bow down in worship of Baal. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. So this was one bad king, worse than any other king before him. Just the kind of king that God needs to send a prophet to warn. So God sends Elijah and his first mission is to tell the king Ahab that God is causing a total drought in the next. In fact, it was going to be immediate and it was going to last for years. In fact, he said not even dew is going to form during this drought. Nothing. 
And this was to show that God is the only true God and he alone could control life-giving rain. Well, here in the Eastern Cape where I live and actually in many parts of South Africa, we have an idea of how hectic this could be. Water is life and without it, we're crippled in so many ways. Well, Elijah delivered the drought message and then God gave him another message pretty quickly. And here was his message, run and hide now. God told him to go and live in a ravine for a while because he was not, let's say, popular with King Ahab. So Elijah listened and he got out of there and God fulfilled his promise and boom, the rain stopped. There wasn't a drop for years until Elijah finally prayed for God to break the drought, which he did. Once again, just highlighting the fact that there is only one God who is in control of all things. Now, that was a huge ministry highlight for Elijah. But he had some other highlights that happened during that period of a couple of years of the drought. While he was living in that ravine, God instructed ravens, the birds, to bring Elijah bread and meat daily so that he was taken care of. And every South African male said, Amen, brother. Bry broekies and meat every day. Yes, please. Well, after a while, though, God told Elijah, get out of the ravine, go into a village because he had instructed a widow there to feed Elijah and take care of him. And it was there that God used Elijah to provide miraculously for this widow and her family. Listen to this little clip of the highlight from 1 Kings 17 verse 10 to 14. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks and he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? Remember that they're in a drought. As she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain. And the crops grow again. And that's exactly what happened. And that's another huge success for Elijah. What a ministry win. Well, sometime later, though, still in that time of the drought, that same widow, her son got sick and actually died. And she was obviously devastated and brought him to Elijah, who took the boy's body out of her arms and went to his upper room there. And let's see what happens in 1 Kings 17, 21 to 24. He stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to the Lord. O Lord, my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer and the life of the child returned and he revived. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. Then the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. Wow. So Elijah prays and the rain stops for years. He gets supernaturally fed by ravens. He prays and the widow receives a miracle of provision with flour and oil. And then he prays for this dead child and he comes back to life. Those are awesome highlights. But there's one more highlight and it's a bit of a long one, but I want to share this one because this particular highlight leads to his failure, which is where we find the lesson. And so this is the story and it's found in 1 Kings chapter 18 from verse 20. It says, So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, now he's speaking to all of Israel and the people, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. 
Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood on the altar, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, you go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it. Call on the name of your God, but do not set fire to the wood. So they prepared one of the bulls, placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, O Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar that they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming or is relieving himself. Or maybe he is away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be wakened. So they shouted louder and following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice. But still, there was no sound, no reply, no response. Then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the 12 tribes or the tribes of Israel. And he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces and laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering and the wood. So he's really trying to make a point here. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. So they did as he said, and the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Then Elijah commanded, seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them all. And Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. That is an incredible story. This is an amazing demonstration of God's power. But actually, if you think about it, for God, this was just him flexing in the tiniest way. But what a victory for Elijah and God's people. Elijah had so many miraculous experiences, you'd think that he'd have unshakable faith. But when the showdown with the Baal worshippers angered King Ahab and his wife Jezebel so much that she vowed to see him dead, Elijah couldn't take it and he fled into the desert. So this dramatic victory could have been the turning point for God's people to turn back to him. But instead of leading them in this change, Elijah is threatened and he runs away to hide in the desert. And he felt at that point completely defeated. Listen to how he felt from 1 Kings 19 verse 3 to 5. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree 
and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than any of my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. So Elijah was tired. He was discouraged. He was overwhelmed. He was depressed and he was suicidal. And it's in this place of weakness that we find lessons from Elijah's failure. Here are three lessons that all of us can learn from Elijah. Lesson number one. We're never closer to defeat than after our moments of greatest victory. Listen to his words again. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. Elijah experienced the depths of fatigue and discouragement after his greatest spiritual victories, which was the defeat of the prophets of Baal. And of course, right after that, the praying for rain, and then it began to rain straight away. Those huge victories and then this big defeat. You would think that he would be unstoppable after those wins, but he wasn't. He was completely depleted. And I know what that's like. Preachers all over the world experience what's known as the Monday blues. Every week we spend hours in research and prayer and preparation to put together a message that is going to encourage and equip our congregations. The whole week builds towards the Sunday. And then once we've preached the message, you might think that we feel on top of the world. Well, we don't. We feel spiritually and emotionally finished. Preachers are as frail and as insecure as anybody else. And so on Mondays, we have the questions. Was the message good enough? Did I give my best? Were people encouraged? Were they equipped? Does that person uh, always have to criticize this thing? That's why they talk about the Monday blues. Because even after a good Sunday... Pastors can get into bad headspace because they're exhausted and depleted. We're never closer to defeat than after our moments of greatest victory. You don't have to be a pastor to know what that's like, though. After maybe you've got this experience, after planning a big birthday party or a wedding for weeks or sometimes months, and then the big day comes and there's all this excitement and it's great. And then it's over. Months of planning and excitement and energy over in a moment. And you can feel pretty flat the next day. Well, that happens with spiritual things too. After who knows what, maybe leading a song in worship or hosting a small group or praying for a friend to get saved for months or fasting for a breakthrough in a personal area of your life. Or maybe finally getting into a good spiritual routine. We can have these highs, these positive things. We can have such a great spiritual victory. But it can take so much out of us that we can be closer to a defeat than we realize. So learn to stay alert, especially in the hours after a great spiritual victory. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I want to be super clear about something really important now. Christians can suffer from depression. You can love Jesus and still have thoughts of self-harm or suicide. You are not a broken Christian if you suffer like this. But you need to talk about it. Please, don't suffer in silence. It shows strength, not weakness. To talk to a trusted leader about this and to be prayed for. It takes strength, not weakness, to make an appointment with a psychologist or a psychiatrist to get medication that can stabilize your emotions. It takes strength, not weakness, to see a professional therapist to give you the tools you need to cope with your emotions. Please, don't suffer in silence with this. If you need help but you don't know where to start, send us a private SMS or WhatsApp to our church mobile number. It is completely private and we can try and get you the help you need. Learn this lesson from Elijah. 
We're never closer to defeat than after our moments of greatest victory. So stay alert. Lesson number two. We are never as alone as we may feel. The big mistake Elijah made here was that he was a spiritual lone ranger. Listen to what he said repeatedly. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left. But Baal has 450 prophets. That's 1 Kings 18.22. Another verse. Elijah replied, I am the only prophet left alive. And now they're trying to kill me too. That's 1 Kings 19 verse 10. And he repeats it again in verse 14. Clearly, Elijah felt like the only one left serving God. He wanted to do life alone though. So he isolated himself. And then he felt alone. Well, obviously he felt alone. He's the one who stayed away from God's other people. Let's be honest. We do the exact same thing too. When we struggle, we don't find godly spiritual friends. We isolate ourselves. And that is the wrong thing for us to do. Elijah was a spiritual lone ranger. But God didn't design any of us to do life alone. Listen to God's response to Elijah in 1 Kings 19 verse 18. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. You see, Elijah might have felt alone, but he definitely wasn't. And you might feel alone, like the only one that's standing up for God in your family or at work or in your class. But be assured and encouraged today. You are not alone. In fact, God has put it in writing so you can turn to his promise whenever you feel like you're alone. Hebrews 13 verse 5b says, For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. And Jesus himself said in Matthew 28 verse 20, And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So learn this lesson from Elijah. We are never as alone as we may feel. God is always there. Lesson number three. God speaks more often in whispers than in shouts. At his lowest point, God didn't shout at Elijah for not having enough faith. God didn't punish Elijah for feeling like giving up and wanting to die. No, God gently encouraged Elijah with a still small voice that he was not alone and that God would help him to keep on going. Look at 1 Kings 19 verse 11 to 13. This is what God says. Go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were to torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? God spoke gently to Elijah. And God speaks gently to us too. So if you're the kind of person that's looking for a dramatic sign or a loud voice, you're probably waiting for the wrong thing. If you're in need of God's leading or God's strength or God's comfort, know that you're going to find it in his presence. Carve out some time for just you and God. Take your Bible and a journal. Bring some worship music with you. And just spend some time in his presence this week. When you do that, you'll learn the lesson that Elijah learned. That God speaks more often in whispers than in shouts. Now, those are the lessons. Stay with me as we close. I believe God is speaking to some people today through this message. And if, you're no, and if you know that you're one of them, you need to cement what he's saying to you right now through prayer. And so there's two kinds of people I want to pray for today. Firstly, I want to pray for you if God's been speaking to you clearly through the message today. You might really resonate with Elijah and know how he felt. Maybe you relate to 
feeling like you're the only real Christian in your family or in your school or at your work. Feels like you're the only one who is trying to do things God's way. And it's tough. Maybe though, you know what it's like to feel that heavy cloud of depression come over you. You feel fine some days and then out of nowhere, you're knocked down again and you feel like this is wrong. Christians shouldn't feel like this. Maybe though, you're feeling completely overwhelmed. Maybe life has just overwhelmed you. Just when you're making progress and you take one step forward, something else happens and you feel like you take two steps back and it's just wave after wave and it feels like you're drowning. Let's learn from Elijah's mistakes today. You are not the only Christian. You are not all alone. You will not be overcome. Listen to God's word to you today from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 to 9. It says, we now have this light shining in our hearts. We have Christ, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We're pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed. We're confused, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. You know, life can be lonely and it can be difficult and it can be uncertain. Life can be overwhelming, but your heavenly father will comfort you and give you peace. He will hold your hand through the fire. He will walk with you through the valley. And so hold on. Can we pray together right now? Father God, we thank you that we can hold on. Thank you, Father God, that you take our hand, that you walk us through the valley of the shadow of death. Father God, I thank you that our emotions can sometimes be all over the place. Lord, we can be down. We can be depressed. We can feel defeated. We can feel overwhelmed. But I thank you, Lord, that in you we have overwhelming victory. Thank you, Lord, that although we are pressed hard on all sides, we are not crushed. And I thank you, Jesus, that you do not abandon us. You are with us always to the end of the age. We give you thanks and we praise you for this, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, there's another group of people that I just love to pray for now. And that's something I mentioned at the beginning of the message was just about the Bible, how it's just one short sentence that the whole Bible is all about. And it's this simple sentence. The entire Bible is the story of God redeeming and restoring a fallen world. Well, every single one of us constantly turns our backs on God and we go our own way. There's always been a gap of sin that existed between God and between us. But now there's good news for all of us. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, that sin gap has been closed for anyone that will put their trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. And if you've never stopped and asked Jesus to forgive you and to be Lord of your whole life, you can do that right now. And we can pray together. Even though you're on that side of the screen and I'm on this side of the screen, it doesn't matter. We can pray. All God has ever wanted is you. He loves you and he wants you to turn back to him. If you know you need to do that today, pray with me, no matter where you are. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that you closed the sin gap, that you sent Jesus to die in my place so that my sins could be forgiven and that I could be made new. Father God, today I put my whole life in your hands. I surrender all that I am to you. Father God, I thank you that I can be your child and you can be my father. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for always making a way for me to come back to you. I pray that today you would take my life and make me your child in Jesus name. Amen. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer, you're starting a whole new chapter of your life today. And let me encourage you, tell someone, tell anyone, tell someone close to you about the decision that you made. We'd like to know, of course, so you can let us know in the comments and we always love that. But also 
tell someone that you care about today that you gave your life to Jesus.